everything is going digital. Our children are being born digital. Uh, some now call them uh, digital natives. So there are issues emerging around uh, content, uh, connectivity, uh, conduct, and a lot of issues that happen uh, online. So in as much as the fourth industrial revolution has expanded, I would say opportunities for children to enjoy rights and to interact with each other, it, also, it has also come with its uh, challenges um, and exposed the children to new uh, dangers. And um, it has also expanded the horizons of rights. Uh, what do children's rights mean? Um, and we don't know what will happen in the next 30 years. Um, this year marks, you will recall, the 30th anniversary of the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. So we don't know what will happen in the next 30 years, but certainly a lot of battles are going to be fought online. Um, where they are talking about parenting, where they are talking about education, where they are talking about recruitment in, um, in armed groups and all that. Uh, so these are some of the, the pressing issues of our time. And uh, to help us in this discussion, I have um, um, a very interesting composition of speakers. We have um, first uh, Professor Julia Sloth Nielsen, who is a professor of public law at the University of the Western Cape. And he has done uh, a lot of work in this area of children's rights. Uh, she has supervised a lot of uh, PhD students uh, to completion. She has written so many um, documents. She has published a lot of um, articles on children's rights, including the first leading textbook, uh, Children's Rights uh, in Africa. So recently, um, Prof completed the draft general comment on children's rights in the digital uh, environment. And I do hope that uh, maybe in a talk, she will reflect a bit uh, on that. So after Prof's remarks, we will uh, then hear from uh, Avani Singhi, who is a director at Alt Advisory, um, an applied law and technology firm, uh, which is based here in Pretoria. They do a lot of uh, digital rights work. And uh, after that, we will hear from, from Florence, who um, hails from Zambia and is working at um, Childline uh, Zambia. Um, and the last person who will address us in this discussion is uh, Afros Kaviani Johnson, who works at uh, UNICEF and is a child protection uh, specialist. Um, so, but without, uh, I mean, without, be, before I really hand over to Prof, I would first request if a list is from the CSO forum to just make a few remarks because we are co-hosting and co-organizing this side event uh, with the CSO forum. Um, Felistas, over to you. Felicitas. Uh, thank you, thank you, Moyo. Um, thank you so much, and and uh, thank you to to the center for having um, for having collaborated with us on this on this session. As you rightfully pointed out, um, this is a very important um, discussion that we are having today, and as civil society organizations, uh, we really find this topic to be very important for us, particularly now where we are called to uh, promote child participation in all that we do, but also uh, now that we find ourselves having to deal with a lot with, a lot with, with issues, around, issues around how do we safeguard the interests of children, how do we make sure that children's rights are protected even during this time, and, and also uh, during an era where COVID has really shown that everything that we have to do has to be online. How far do we go 
what, what children can consume, how far can we go in protecting the rights uh, of children during this era. So it will be interesting. Uh, we're looking forward to learning from the panelists in terms of their insights and their experiences. And we are looking to engage uh, in the conversations. Uh, so welcome everyone. And thank you so much for having made time to, to join us today. We hope that there will be um, takeaways or take home messages that we, they can help us to improve our interventions that can help us to ensure that we can provide uh, services that um, promoting uh, equality, but over and above ensuring that children's rights are uh, protected uh, during this digital and virtual era. Thank you so much, Moyo. Um, th thank you for those uh, remarks. Um, just a, a footnote before we hand over the floor to Professor Slot Nelson, um, that if you require Arabic interpretation, you may want to, to select the Japanese channel because Zoom doesn't have that option for you to choose Arabic. But we are offering Arabic interp uh, interpretation uh, via the Japanese uh, channel. Um, for others who are comfortable with uh, French and Portuguese, uh, this event is also being, um, you know, uh, interpreted into this, um, uh, translated into this, these languages. I will then hand over to uh, Professor Sloth Nielsen to give us some introductory remarks about uh, this important topic. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Moyo, and thank you also to the Center for Human Rights and to the CSO Forum for organizing this very timely event. Um, before I commence my very brief presentation um, on children's rights and digital technology with a reference to some uh, African perspectives, uh, I would like to make uh, three points. The first is that, um, as many of the uh, participants <laughs> might be aware, I presented on the 1st of September a draft general comment to the African Committee of Experts on the Rights of the Child on Article 27 of the Charter, which deals with the prevention um, of the child from various forms of sexual exploitation. And of necessity, and as per the brief that the committee gave me, a substantial part of this general comment, draft general comment, is devoted to sexual exploitation in the online environment. However, having said that, the limitation of looking only at this general comment is that it focuses only on Article 27 of the Charter, which is one child, child right, um, and neglects to deliberately, as per the brief, to focus on other dimensions of children's rights in the digital era. Subsequent to my preparing and submitting my draft general comment on Article 27 of the Charter, um, quite recently, a matter of two weeks ago, the CRC committee in Geneva has released its full text draft general comment on children's rights in the digital era, which is freely available on the homepage of the CRC committee. This general comment of the CRC committee flows from a day of general discussion, which was held by the committee in, I think it was 2016. It also flows from a concept note that was released approximately 18 months ago, maybe a bit longer and on which public submissions were made. And this has now been concretized in a substantive general comment on all aspects of children's rights and digital technology. Um, I have obviously subsequent to preparing general comment uh, number seven on article 27 of the charter, um, perused the CRC committee's gen generic general comment and incorporated some of those perspectives where they apply to the question of child sexual abuse and exploitation. 
But obviously, the second document I'm talking about is much broader um, in scope than the general comment on Article 27. Um, but I will refer to a couple of aspects of the CRC committee's draft general comment in my presentation. So with that somewhat lengthy introduction, I'd like to start with a couple of slides dealing with overarching considerations. Um, these figures are actually um, figures that I got this morning. Um, firstly, that smartphone penetration currently stands at far below 50% of the total population in most African countries. Um, and this source cited a 2017 survey showing that uh, smart smartphone penetration was 51% in South Africa, 30% in Kenya, and 13% in Tanzania, three examples. Internet penetration as of March 2020 stood at 39.3% of the total population, which is probably higher than most people would actually expect given the large number of people living in a marginal urban context and in rural context. But this compares to the rest of the world, which stands at 62.9%. In some countries such as Ghana and South Africa, smartphone and internet penetration seem to go hand in hand. But for other countries, and the ones cited are Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal, internet penetration is way ahead of smartphone penetration. Further overarching consideration that I find highly relevant is that at present, 297 million children in Africa are out of school as a result of COVID-19. 75% of these learners have limited or no access to interactive and internet-based learning materials. And the implications of this digital divide between the digital natives that Dr. Moyo spoke of and those that do not have any access <coughs> are entirely related to the perpetuation of entrenched discrimination between the haves and the have-nots as regards digital access. And we also see in the paper that I read that current ed tech initiatives to replace face-to-face -face schooling depend on Sorry, Mulugeta, somebody is switching off my share screen. So I'll have to try again. Thank you. Um, the EdTech initiatives depend not only on access to a digital device, but also on the existence of open access materials, on the extent of connectivity that can be enjoyed, which varies and crucially also on costs, especially data costs. Further, uh, less direct implications relate to privacy. Often one finds that education is impeded because there's no privacy in the home environment to enable a learner who might have connectivity to <coughs> access materials. The lack of parental skills and being able to advise and coach in the education space. And of course, lack of access of skills of teachers are also inhibiting factors to online education. Those are my overarching considerations, which I think are relevant in the African context. The few um, issues that I want to highlight, because I don't want to traverse the um, protection issues that I think that um, Afrus Kaviani Johnson is going to be raising too much, uh, and nor do I want to enter into the realm of the other speakers in this webinar. But I do want to point to the legal and regulatory environments that prevail in Africa. And this is covered to some extent in the draft general comment for the African Committee of Experts. It's no secret that for the most part, legal and regulatory environments in African countries are generally quite weak or in some cases, non-existent, for instance, on cybersecurity uh, as one example. And here, of course, we have to look at the Malabo Convention, which has not enjoyed a sufficient number of ratifications on the continent. The um, such reg legal and regulatory 
structures and laws that do exist are often based on very data de definitions, such as the definition of child pornography, which tends towards paper-based um, <coughs> uh, versions thereof. Possession, which is not necessarily going to be a feature of, of online um, uh, environments because you've got nothing physical in your possession. Premises is another uh, of common feature of legislation, which is defined usually as physical premises and excludes new forms of uh, digital communication in chat rooms and live streaming and so forth. We also see very weak evidentiary tools and laws for the digital environment where there are huge issues around proof, around storage of data and around volatility of data. Government regulation of ISPs is not always optimal and state parties have great difficulties in holding transnational multinational businesses in operating in the digital space to account simply because they are less equipped to do so and have less strong regulatory environments. I asked the question if we can find or develop good examples of intra-African law enforcement or regulatory or even legal development cooperation that would obviate some of these weaknesses. I also ask whether there are any good examples in Africa of real and useful control of digital marketing of commercial products to children, for instance, in the context of automated decision making by, for instance, algorithms, and whether we can find good examples on the prevention of collection and distribution of children's personal information by business interests, because these would be very useful to share and put out there for consumption by countries that do not have the necessary expertise in this domain. I turn now to girls and I want to highlight a range of concerns here. In 2016, I did some research for the Association of Progressive Communications on freedom of expression online in Africa, which showed at that time, this may have changed, I haven't updated it yet, <coughs> that girls have considerably less access to digital environments than do boys, uh, indicative also of the pervasive <coughs> discrimination and patriarchy that girls experience in Africa. We also see the over-sexualization in the way in which girls are portrayed in the online environment. For <coughs> girls as victims, they are the primary victims in the digital environment as regards sexting and sextortion. We need to deepen the discourse around the criminalization of teenagers, not only girls, but generally girls are the victims of this, who distribute self-generated sexually explicit contact with the concomitant risk of these images being spread further and further afield without authorization and lasting forever in cyberspace. We know of the increased online grooming risks that exist through uh, access to digital environments. We have very few countries in Africa that have got adequate cyberbullying and harassment or anti-stalking laws. And this again needs to be addressed. And then I also raise the question of the uh, explicit transposition of safeguarding policies, which we have seen mushroom in the offline environment to the necessity for them to be transposed to the online environment for protective purposes. Turning to access to information and freedom of expression, um, which are not covered obviously in the general comment on sexual exploitation, but are covered quite extensively in the general comment of the CRC committee. Clearly the internet and uh, digital media promote access to information from a huge diversity of sources, but there's a fine line between protecting children from harmful information, such as online radicalization, uh, exposure to pedophilia, exposure to gambling, between that on the one hand and censorship, which deprives them of access to a variety of points of view. 
We know that the internet can provide children with an unprecedented opportunity to demonstrate, as never before, their evolving capacities and to act with agency independently of their parents or adults who are frequently less technologically literate than are the younger generation. There is the requirement that needs to be built into regulations and guidelines that age appropriate information be provided and that it be provided from a plurality of sources, which include all forms of mass media, radio, etc., to equip children with the digital literacy they need to sift the information that is fake news from information that is useful to them. We know from the comments in general comments um, of the CRC committee that filters and other barriers, which have long been the way in which protection to children um, has seemed to be uh, optimally provided, that these should be regulated by law and that they should be proportionate. Automated search engines should not direct children first to paid content at the cost of their right to a broad variety of information. And digital service providers should be encouraged to provide children with age appropriate and intelligible content labeling. There is great concern about data breaches related to children's information and surveillance via digital media, which states parties need to control for unwarranted interference with their privacy. And the general comment of the CRC committee demands high standards of transparency and accountability on the part of private commercial interests. <clears throat> Dignity and safety lies at the core of children's rights to privacy. And we know that threats may come from parents, so-called sharenting, where parents share pictures of their infants and young children online in such a way as to cause possible later harm or ridicule to the children. Threats may come from peers, educators, strangers, and threats may also come from data collection by public institutions, businesses with the threat of hijacking and identity theft being prevalent. We know that automated processes and behavior targeting may unlawfully interfere with children's rights to privacy and that strong regulation and access to remedies is required. Particularly robust measures are needed in the African context in public settings, for instance, internet cafes, where children might use digital media to ensure privacy and protection. Not all negative. So I end up with this slide where I try and focus some on some of the more positive opportunities for this continent. First, it's unquestionable that the digital environment provides huge opportunities for scaling up birth registration. For instance, online birth registration units for hard to reach populations. And there are uh, conferences and meetings around the continent that are promoting the scaling up of online um, additional birth registration modalities. I believe that there's a possibility of scaled up use of reporting avenues for violence against children, um, moving beyond the uh, existing hotlines to other forms of digital communication. And of course, I'm not a digital native, so I can only write there what I know, Twitter or WhatsApp, but I'm sure that there, is, there are other possibilities there. The question of digital contact in the case of family separation will promote children's rights to family life. And here we must look at migration in particular, but also possibly other causes of family separation. There is a great deal of inf information out there which points to the expanded access to health information and services that can be digitally obtained, including through various apps. And this will be particularly useful for adolescents when it comes to sexual and reproductive health information. We must acknowledge and promote the expanded opportunities the digital era provides for leisure and for play, but also for access to culture in the African context. And then finally, I believe that digital technology used correctly 
can promote more child-friendly justice solutions, avoiding the need for detention, for court appearances, moving to um, online restorative justice processes such as mediation, and thereby promoting children's access to diversion. So with those few remarks, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof, for that uh, wide-ranging um, analysis of the key issues um, that are mushrooming up because of technology and, and the internet. Um, somebody in the chat room already says, uh, thank you so much. This is uh, very, very informative. Um, so I won't really uh, repeat the, the main points. Maybe we will reflect. I can already put Nkatha on the, on the spot to, to think about how to reflect uh, on what speakers would have said at the end. Um, and I'm ambushing her. I, I hope that she won't chase me away from my job. Um, so our next speaker um, is Avani. Avani is a director, like I said, at uh, Out Advisory, which is a, an applied law and technology um, firm. Avani will talk about uh, the challenges and opportunities that are there in terms of the right to privacy in the digital age. Um, Avani, I will hand the floor to you now. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and just um, really want to commend the Center for Human Rights um, and the CSO Forum for having this really important and timely discussion about children's rights in the digital age. Um, just to start off, I suppose, and building on from the previous presentation, I think it's important for me to note that I am a tech evangelist. I believe completely in the power of technology to connect, to explore, to learn, to communicate. And I think that this power that technology holds also applies equally with regard to children who have the right to learn and grow and play and can use technology to explore aspects of their identity, their sexuality and their developmental growth at appropriate stages in their, in their lives. Um, you know, as, as we've already discussed, COVID-19 has really highlighted for us the importance of technology to realize the full array of fundamental rights. And in a time of social distancing, it's made connection possible um, and importantly facilitated a range of other rights, such as the right to education, most, most notably. But what I'm going to be focusing on today is that it's essential to us that when we make use of technology, whether that's public Wi-Fi access, whether that's online search engines, social media platforms, uh, cell phones, anything of the sort, that children are able to do so safely and, secure, and securely, and that they do so without being subject to different forms of harm, which includes violations of the right to privacy. And this, I think, gives rise to a number of different tensions, specifically where unwittingly or unknowingly, children may hand over pieces of their personal information in exchange for certain services, particularly free services that may be offered, without knowledge of what that information will be used for beyond that very specific purpose for which they understand it to be. In the current context, every day, we see children's rights to privacy being infringed. This comes from a range of different ways, um, including indiscriminate use of CCTV cameras, the tracking of communications data and profiling based on information being shared. Online, a child's privacy can be eroded by the processing of personal data, online surveillance, the building and maintaining of records of children's entire digital existence, the use of biometrics, pre-existing risks such as online stalking and harassment, and exposure to unwant unwanted or inappropriate content. States, private sector actors, civil society, and regional bodies all have a critical role to play in navigating this tension. And I want to emphasize that in navigating this tension, it's important to have children's voices as part of the conversation, to understand and educate uh, children as part of this process. What we want to see is that children are able to harness the benefits of technology while having their privacy rights respected, protected, and fulfilled, both on and offline. 
you know, we often hear that privacy is not, is, is a tangential right. Um, people don't necessarily see the importance or the value of the right to privacy in exchange for other services. But this is a false notion. Um, privacy is important not only in itself as a self-standing right, but also as an enabler of a range of other rights, ranging from freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of thought, conscience, religion, um, public participation, dignity, equality, non-discrimination. Often we hear this misnomer that the only people who want to exercise the right to privacy are those who have something to hide. But this is wrong, and I think repeatedly has been shown not to be the case. Both the United Nations Human Rights Committee, uh, Commission, um, uh, sorry, Human Rights Council, and the African Commission have made clear that the right to privacy is a pivotal and central right and applies equally both on and offline and it requires appropriate measures to be taken to give effect to this right. I want to turn next to look at some of the regional frameworks on the right to privacy, which to be fair are relatively scant. As many of you may know, the African Charter is silent on the right to privacy and doesn't contain an express provision on this right. This makes the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child a seminal document because it is the only regional, regional treaty currently in force that contains a substantive provision on the right to privacy. In this regard, Article 10 of um, the African uh, Convention on the Rights and Welfare of the Child provides that no child may be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his privacy, family, home or correspondence, or to attacks on his honor or reputation, provided that parents or legal guardians shall have the right to exercise reasonable supervision over the conduct of their children. The child has the right to protection of the law against such interference or attacks. I want to spend a moment focusing on this proviso contained in Article 10 of the Convention um, regarding the reasonable supervision that can be exercised by parents, which interestingly is a key distinction between the African Convention um, and the Convention on the Rights of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Academic and commentators have attributed this inclusion regarding reasonable supervision um, to the specific cultural context that we find ourselves in in Africa um, and the importance of family norms um, in the Africa. But as, as the previous speaker noted, parents themselves, parents or guardians themselves can be responsible for violating the privacy rights of children. Um, and in giving effect to this, pro uh, to this proviso, Parents, parents and guardians would also be cognizant not to violate the privacy rights of the child or erode it to such an extent that the right becomes meaningless. As has been explained by the African Committee of Experts, there is a need to strike a balance between the authority exerted by adults over their children and the corresponding responsibility of children to be respectful and mindful of such authority. And in striking that balance, what we want to see is that the right itself, the right to privacy is not rendered nugatory or meaningless but rather gives effect to it in a meaningful and responsible way. The other key instrument as far as the um, legal framework on the right to privacy goes is the revised Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa, which was adopted last year by the African Commission. This is a really um, important document because it contains a comprehensive right on the uh, comprehensive protection of the right to privacy, including privacy over communications. It also deals with specific um, forms of technology and provides for the protection of the right to privacy um, through, for example, the ability to communicate anonymously, the ability to communicate using pseudonyms, for example, the use of encryption technology and the responsibility on states not to seek to weaken privacy protections that exist. Whilst we also have the African Union Convention on Data Protection and Cybersecurity, this is unfortunately not yet in force. Um, and is in any event silent on the protection of the rights to the child. So really the two instruments at the regional level that we're focusing on is the African um, Convention on the Rights and Welfare of the Child and the Revised Declaration of Principles. And this gives rise to a number of obligations um, that, that apply both to states, to private sector actors, to parents and guardians, and to children themselves. With regard to states, the policy debate has largely been shaped by the need to protect children from harmful content. And while this is certainly an important consideration, this needs to be balanced against the right of children to explore online content that is relevant, age appropriate, and meaningful to the child's development. 
we need to ensure that in protecting the child's right to privacy, there are age appropriate measures in, in the laws um, that do not encroach on the right to privacy, such as, for example, when dealing with surveillance laws that contain provisions that protect the children's rights and give special consideration to the rights of children. Most importantly, I think, is that states have a clear obligation to create an enabling environment for the exercise of the right to privacy, particularly through the enactment of data protection laws with relevant provisions regarding the protection of personal information regarding children. The second category of um, stakeholders that I want to mention is the duties on technology companies and private sector actors. While the African Convention does not specifically engage the duties of private sector actors, General Comment 5 of the African Committee of, Expe of Experts finds that the African Convention also applies to private sector actors. These are clearly key constituency groups that need to be engaged and dealt with as they process vast amounts of personal information regarding children and have access to reams of personal information of children online. Online platforms and social media companies, for example, wield significant power over how various rights are, are advanced or limited in the online space. But this remains a significant challenge. Existing laws, reg domestically, regionally, and globally, do not adequately safeguard children's privacy rights online. And there appears to be a lack of coherent safeguards or guidelines on the duties and obligations of the private sector in this regard. Children's data privacy is of particular concern with private sector actors having the capabilities and scope to erode children's privacy rights to a significant extent. And children also ex are, are at risk of being exposed to inappropriate content or have little or ill-informed Ill knowledge of the implications of the digital footprints that they create. This can last with them for a number of years throughout their lifetimes and may start at a very early age um, and may have implications for them down the line, for example, when they apply for jobs regarding their credit scoring um, a in a range of different ways. So the question before us, I suppose, is how do we manage these challenges? Um, and I want to bring to your attention two recent developments on the right to privacy from the UK and the United States, respectively. The first is a recent publication by the UK's Information Commissioner's Office, who published a children's code known as the Age Appropriate Design Code, which is a data protection code of practice um, for online services, such as apps, online games, websites, and social media platforms. Specifically, it addresses how to design data protection safeguards in online services. They are appropriate for use by and meet the developmental needs of children. This set of guidelines contains 15 principles um, that are relevant across a number of different contexts um, and certainly a document that's worth looking at. But I want to highlight a few of these principles um, as we navigate this discussion and this debate. The first principle that is highlighted is the best interest of the child. Um, and it holds that the best interest of the child should be a primary consideration when you design and develop online services that are likely to be accessed by a child. Transparency is central. The privacy of information that is provided to users, and for example, in the terms and conditions, um, must be concise, prominent, and clear language that is suitable to the age of the child. Hi, Avani. Um, can I request you to maybe uh, round off in the next yes. few minutes? We are doing badly in terms of, of time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and then the third principle that I wanted to highlight is the principle of data minimization regarding that where personal information is collected and retained, only the minimum amount of personal data is done so. The second development has been the California Consumer Privacy Regulations under the, Consumer, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act. And I just, the only point that I want to make here is that interestingly, it distinguishes between children of different ages so it deals with children, the protection of privacy rights of children under the age of 13, between the ages of 13 and 15, and above the age of 16 and older. And this gives rise to serious considerations around consent. Um, and the fact that children, instead of dealing with children as just persons under the age of 18, there are a range of privacy considerations that arise at different phases of the child's development. So in conclusion, the question is, what do we do next? And there are a couple of things that I would like to encourage. Um, as we've already discussed, 
there's an urgent need for an ap appropriate regulatory environment that offers effective pr protections and remedies for privacy violations. This needs to be informed by multi-stakeholder engagement um, that brings together a range of different stakeholders in the space. Digital literacy for parents and children is imperative. Um, and lastly, we need to encourage the development of privacy protecting technologies. And my final comment, just building on the work of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, uh, the Committee of the Rights of the Child regarding the new general comment, is that there's also work to be done by the African Committee of Experts in developing its own potential general comment or guidance, specifically looking at the right to privacy and how this applies in the African context. Thank you, Edmar. Uh, th thank you, Avani, for that incisive discussion. Um, I guess what is emerging from Prof's presentation and your presentation is that we really need to reflect um, on what exactly child-appropriate information looks like and what everybody has to do, whether it's tech companies, uh, private players, um, parents, and everyone. And, and one of the issues that is emerging from the chat room, I think, uh, which is a huge issue, revolves around parental mediation. Um, you know, to what extent should parents uh, limit children's use of digital um, devices? Um, how, where do you draw the boundary? Um, people are raising issues of harm. So you may want to, to reflect already on this as the, the discussion unfolds. Um, without uh, wasting uh, a lot of time, I would want to invite um, Maxim, who will represent uh, Florence, who is not able, unfortunately, to join us at the moment. Uh, Maxim uh, works in Zambia. I would ask my young brother to introduce himself as you present. So you have about uh, 15 minutes. We are doing really badly, but if you can finish, um, you know, around uh, five past, that, that would be fantastic. Uh, over to you, Maxim. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Admark. Uh, I'm just trying to share. Okay. I, yes. I don't know whether you're enabled to share. Um, Yolanda? Yes, she has enabled me. Okay. Uh, apologies from Miss Florence Chile Shinkua, who is the CEO for Lifeline Child Line Zambia and the Africa Regional Representative for Child Lifeline International. Your network is bad where she is. So I'll do the presentation on your behalf. Uh, my name is Maxim Murungwen. Um, with the Child Deadline International. Sorry, just a minute. A... Um, Dom Dominique, the French interpreters, the French uh, people are complaining. The French is not very clear. Kindly, are you able to check on that? French interpretation? Please check on that. It's not very clear. Sorry, go on. Okay. So I'm saying my name is Maxim Rungwen. I'm with Child Deploy International as the project coordinator for Eastern and Southern Africa. So I'll do the presentation on behalf of Florence on the challenges and opportunities in the digital age. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I will start with a quotation which says, human beings forget, but the internet or the digital sphere does not forget. This sums up my presentation uh, because you are saying that the internet does not forget. If you do good things, if children do good things, they suddenly go viral on the internet and on the various social media platforms that are there. And they will stay there for a long time and they will reach out to a wide audience. At the same time, it is a, if there are bad things about children also, they will go viral and they will stay there for a long time doing more harm to the children, both physically, emotionally, psychologically. So we can see how the internet 
has the potential to either damage or to uh, build our children. So we should really see how powerful the digital age is, the media, internet is, the social media is, and we should take advantage of the harness. How then do we use it for the positives? So as the child deadlines, we receive, we collect information from children on a day-to-day -day basis, tons of information through the uh, helplines, the four telephones, or through the internet, through various social media platforms, Facebook, WhatsApp, etc. So we've got day-to-day -day interaction with children, getting information from children. So we are saying the mobile phones and information and community technologies can be great enablers for human rights, for example, bringing learning opportunities to others, as well enable people in remote areas to uh, get access to information and participate in the digital economy. However, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a growth in the number of children accessing the internet. I think Prof. Julia uh, Sloth highlighted that the internet penetration and also the, the availability of cell phones is very low. But I think after this COVID-19, and the, as, especially for child deadlines, we've seen more and more children having more time on internet and also consulting, getting in touch with the child deadlines across Africa through the, the various forms, uh, platforms like social media, Facebook, uh, YouTube, WhatsApp, uh, et cetera. So it shows that the internet use has grown, especially during this pandemic. This is because of the lockdown restrictions and the fact that children are now more spending more time at home instead of school. So they end up going on the internet to access and to make sure that they connect with their friends. So as Chap Line International, we are a global organization with 168 members in over 139 countries. And in Africa, we've got about 36 members in more than 32 countries. And we still have more who are joining in. This is just to sum up to see to give the scope of how we of our reach to children in terms of inter, how we reach them out and how the information that we collect on a daily basis. So what is a child helpline? A child helpline, we really rely on the digital sphere, on the digital technology, because we are saying our services offer them through the common toll-free numbers, which is usually the 116, that is the most common, the investor one, which we want to make investor in Africa. So children get, get through, contact us through this. But because we cannot only reach children through toll frees, and you have realized that children also spend more time on the, through the digital platforms, especially social media. Child deadlines have also put options that children can contact them through chat, email, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and, and even the websites. So how then are airplanes relevant in the digital area? So especially in this COVID-19 context, we've seen that the role of child airplanes as trusted mechanism for support and assistance to children is more crucial in times of calamity, like the time now, where in most countries who are, which are on lockdown, physical interaction with children is impossible. So children are getting help. They are contacting the airplanes through the telephone, the toll-free lines, through the Instagram, through Twitter, through Facebook. We also, crucial, child deadlines are crucial in data collection. We are hearing children's voices, especially their experience during this lockdown. Such, so the increase of traffic that child deadlines have witnessed in terms of, uh, of, of, of course, and also interaction from children through the digital platform has increased, especially during this lockdown. I can give you one good example for Zambia, where on average, before lockdown, they used to receive on average 27,000 calls, but currently they are receiving up to 35 to 45,000 calls on a monthly basis. So how then does this link in terms of digital platform? How then do we promote children's rights? The mission statement of Child Deploy International, we seek to harness the power of ICT and create a world where technology allows children to be heard one by one and through their voices shape the world and realize their rights. So as an organization, collective globally, 
we realize the power of the digital sphere. So we said we have a deliberate effort to make sure that we reach out, we use information and communication technology to hear children's voices so that the children's voices are heard and also their rights are realized. So some of the opportunities, I think the two previous speakers have spoken about them, but I'll just go giving practical examples that is coming from the child deadlines in Africa. So we are saying number one, the internet provides an opportunity for children to enjoy their rights. So this internet, the fact that children are able to connect, they're able to express themselves, their right to freedom of expression, their right to leisure, their right to education. We can see that children, because of COVID-19 restrictions, learning has gone on online. Children are conducting lessons online. So this then provides to make sure that there is no gap where children miss out on school because of lockdown restrictions. So in the internet, the children are using the internet to learn. Secondly, we are saying as child deadlines, we are also now providing psychosocial support and counseling to children through these digital platforms, social media platforms such as Facebook, WhatsApp, because of the COVID-19 prevalent measures. So most of the majority of the child deadlines, they've enhanced their use of their WhatsApp and Facebook pages so that they reach out to children and the response has been massive. We've seen children reaching out to each other, deadlines on WhatsApp, on Facebook. This has enabled the children who are not able to, whom we are not able to reach physically because of lockdown, so that we are able to provide that emergency kind, which is needed in this time of COVID-19. We are also saying the child deadlines are using social media to promote services. We have seen our members putting on our Facebook and WhatsApp advertising the service that they are providing outside there so that the children, the young people, and even others to reach out uh, on them to provide the service, especially in this time of COVID. We have also seen how these digital platforms help us to and children access information, which you, they use slang and memes, including abbreviations uh, so, and acronyms. So these, they make interaction for children easy and it's an opportunity for children then to gain in access information. Also, one of the underrated, I think, functions of uh, and opportunity of digital platform is communicate. They, they provide an opportunity for children to communicate with friends and family, especially during this lockdown. We have received cases where children are saying, my parents have been locked in one country because of lockdown, they are not able to come. So they are saying we are communicating with these parents through WhatsApp, Facebook, and this is how the children are trying to cope psychologically because of this separation that has happened. We have also seen children doing homework and looking for information and also playing games in these digital platforms. And also entertainment. We know the children, they have got right to play, right to leisure. So they are also using the digital platforms to, for entertainment. The example, games, music on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We've also seen them children learning new skills from the exposure that they get from the digital platforms, which is uh, very encouraging. We also know about the power of the hashtags, where, we want, where you want to spread information, and then our members are creating hashtags so that they reach out to the children, they reach out to the young people, they reach out to the uh, adults using the hashtag. So we also acknowledge the power of the hashtags in terms of how we use them to for information and also to make a certain issue, particular issue trend in terms of children's rights. So these are some of the opportunities that are there. We also look at how we can use the social media to raise awareness on, on various child rights issues. I think most of the organizations are doing that. Especially, specifically for child airplanes across Africa, they are using the social media to advertise their opening hours and we've seen how they are sending out tips on how children can protect themselves online and child protection, especially during this time of COVID. So I've spoken about how the digital platform can be used to provide information and link uh, children and uh, young adults to information and services. We also use um, this to I, I Maxim, you, you, yes. have, uh, you have about two minutes. You, you will need to round off so okay. that we are good on the, the time. Yes. So when you look at online risk for children, I think there are three phases. The, the, the first one is when the children, they are, the risk is there when they, on, on the content, what children receive. 
or on online. This then becomes a risk. This uh, some of I think the previous speakers have spoken about the information that is there. They will have to get full and pornographic information. And then secondly, when the children contact uh, through when they go online, then they, that's where they contact strangers who then recruit them in grooming, cyberbullying, and tracking. And then they also look at the conduct. How do the children themselves conduct themselves when they are online? It also presents a risk to themselves. So what are the challenges? I think number one challenge, like Prof. said, is the issue of digital divides. We have seen that there are other children who cannot access this digital device. So what is happening to those children, especially in this time of COVID? So it means they are being further left behind. We have seen issue of cyberbullying, issue of sexual abuse, pornography, et cetera. And then we've also, as airplanes, we have a challenge when providing online psychosocial support or counseling. How do we maintain the issue of confidentiality when you are providing counseling on Facebook, on WhatsApp? How do we make sure that we balance, the, we maintain the issue of confidentiality? We also, how do we do risk assessment of your client when you are doing this uh, uh, counseling over, the, over Facebook or WhatsApp? So that's, that's a dilemma that we have as helplines. How do we then make sure that we balance issue of confidentiality at the same time uh, providing the services to the children through WhatsApp, Facebook? We have also the dilemma of balancing children's rights and the right to privacy versus online protection. This is the previous speakers. We also have a challenge of policy versus implementation. The existing policies, like, I think like Prof said, some the policies are still lagging behind. If they are there, the implementation also is a challenge. Do we have online country-specific online pro uh, policies or strategies that are there? And this is an example of how the airplanes are reaching out through Facebook, like the Life Launch in Zambia, the Facebook page, which reaches out to Zimbabwe, South Africa, United Kingdom, India, Namibia, et cetera. So we're able to, they are able to reach children and adults in those areas. And this is the piece, how the, the digital can be used as a grievance regress, regress mechanism, where we, the child airplanes are using these platforms to get feedback from the clients and grievances and address them. So yeah, thank you I, very much. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, those remarks. I think uh, you have highlighted the issues that come with uh, connectivity. And these issues relate to content, um, conduct, and also conduct. Uh, the, the conducts that uh, children uh, get to know on, online. Um, but one pressing issue, I think, from Avani's presentation and your, your presentation, uh, where you started, I think is this thing you call digital footprints. Um, I call them digital tattoos, but the internet doesn't, doesn't forget. And these things may come to hound children later in their life course. Um, given our time constraints, I would now want to invite our last uh, speaker, who is... Um, uh, Afros Kavian Johnson from UNICEF. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Moyo. Let me also share my screen. And indeed, I echo the comments of the earlier speakers. Uh, thank you to the Center for Human Rights and to the CSO Forum for convening this very important discussion and, and timely. Um, also thanks to the participants. It's great to see a diverse um, array of participants and, and following the chat uh, debates and discussions in the chat box as well. So my um, last, um, the, the last presentation for, for this, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, is looking specifically at COVID-19 and its implications on protection rights in particular. Um, as previous speakers have alluded to, uh, COVID-19 has really upended the lives of children and families around the world. So we are all well aware and are experiencing how school closures and movement restrictions have disrupted uh, children's routines, um, they've disrupted support systems, and they've also added new stresses on parents and caregivers. 
obviously um, in countries where there is uh, wide access to digital tech technology, more and more aspects of people's lives have moved online. And similarly uh, for children, many of their learning experiences have been reshaped by the introduction of remote learning. But as Professor Sloth Nielsen referred to in, in her initial remarks, um, the massive scale of school closures has really laid bare uh, the uneven distribution of technology needed to facilitate remote learning at home. Um, while more than 90% of countries have implemented some form of remote learning policy because of COVID-19, it's estimated that there are at least 463 million students worldwide cut off um, from education. And that's mainly due to a lack of remote learning po policies or the lack of equipment required for learning at home. And it's actually school children in Eastern and Southern Africa that are most affected, where it's estimated that at least half of all students cannot be reached with remote learning. So as again, previous speakers have alluded to, Basic internet connectivity remains a challenge for many children in uh, the poorest countries and in rural areas. And COVID-19 has really brought into sharp focus the extent to which unconnected children are missing out on educational resources, access to global information, as well as all those opportunities to learn digital skills, to explore friendships and develop new forms of self-expression. On the other hand, uh, for children with access to technology, we've seen how digital technology has enabled unprecedented opportunities during COVID. Again, I think Maxim also elaborated on this a lot with respect to their learning, their socialization and play. The pandemics forced us to use digital technology for distance learning on a scale never done before um, and has also become a lifeline for children to connect with family and friends for play and entertainment and so on. At the same time, it's revealed the lack of systems to support teachers and caregivers in the safe, effective and secure use of technology for learning. So parents and caregivers have been asked to navigate their children's shift to online learning and recreation. But the reality is that many parents and caregivers are less familiar with the new technologies and also many are less able to spend time with their children due to the pressures of working from home. As a result, uh, we're seeing that many children have greater unsupervised uh, internet access, which might put them at heightened risk of harm. So COVID-19 um, and its associated containment measures have exacerbated existing drivers of online child sexual exploitation and provided new opportunities for abusers. Um, there are a lot of reports out there from different law enforcement agencies and the like um, and um, online safety uh, authorities such as the Australian eSafety's um, commissioner whose in online investigations observed an increase of coronavirus related activity in the dark web. In one forum, for example, predators noted that isolation measures have expanded opportunities to contact children remotely via platforms such as YouTube, Instagram, and random web chat services. Likewise, the US-based National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NECMEC for short, um, became aware of predators openly discussing the pandemic as an opportunity to entice unsupervised children into producing sexually explicit material. In April, um, NECMEC said it recorded a 106% increase in cyber tip line reports of suspected child sexual exploitation. And there's an Interpol report, which I just saw released today on COVID-19, um, child sexual abuse and exploitation threats and trends, which are also noting increased reports from member countries and NGOs about online activity during um, the COVID-19 pandemic relating to child sexual abuse materials. So in some cases, it's that children are lonely and they're isolated. And it's well known that abusers will often target children who have shown vulnerability online. Abusers may connect with them to produce explicit material or arrange to meet them in real life. 
UNICEF's research is showing us that many children are feeling extremely stressed during COVID-19. And children have said that they're worried about everything from being isolated from family and friends and catching or even dying from the virus. So it's also likely impossible that cyberbullying uh, may increase uh, with children experiencing extended periods of unstructured time online and also grappling with stress. Um, and of course, there are particular categories of children that are more vulnerable to cyberbullying, including girls, uh, children with disabilities, or those perceived to be different um, or at greater risk of catching or spreading the virus. Another risk is that um, the lack of in-person interaction with friends and partners may lead on older children to engage in riskier behaviour online. For example, through sexting or sharing of self-generated sexualised content. And this can expose um, children to the risks of extortion, harassment and humiliation. Another area um, of concern is that with the rush to set up distance learning, schools might not have had proper child safeguarding policies in place to govern uh, student and teacher conversations via private networks and other online tools. And, and other risks um, that arise from the increased online activity include the risks of exposure to age inappropriate or potentially harmful content, um, also larger quantities of targeted online marketing, um, misinformation uh, about COVID that could drive additional fear and anxiety. And then there may also be added collection and processing of children's personal data by companies, including um, educational applications. So, the situation looks very bleak from what I've just presented, um, but, it, but it is very important to remember that not all risks that children encounter online translate into actual harms. So there's a distinction, um, and that's, that's really important to remember that there's a distinction between risk and harm, because not everyone that encounters risks are harmed by it. Um, and the experience of harm is often linked to other vulnerabilities in children's lives. So as children take up um, the opportunities enabled through digital technology, we must identify and mitigate the risks that might cause harm. And as previous speakers have emphasized, we need to balance these measures with children's other rights, their rights to freedom of expression, their rights to privacy and access to information. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm afraid that uh, we're doing badly in terms of time. Can you no. round off? I'll give you two minutes to just um, uh, say your last uh, words on them. Okay, yeah. no worries. I will be very concise. I might negotiate to have three if possible. Um, okay. I think, um, yeah, as previous speakers have also alluded to, it really does need a multi-sectoral uh, response. And I have some key recommendations for advocacy here. Um, most importantly, the need to recognize children as agents of change and equip them with the knowledge and information they need to navigate their online lives safely. Um, keeping children informed and engaged about the risks in a way that matches their evolving capacities is a critical defense uh, during COVID-19 and beyond. Um, the next point would just note that more than ever before, our parents and caregivers are at the forefront of keeping their children safe. Um, and so they can help their children access online resources while at the same time being alert to online risks and to any signs of distress. The other really important thing to emphasize for parents is to ensure open communication with their children on how and with whom they're communicating online and to help them um, know that kind and supportive interactions are expected and that hurtful, discriminatory or inappropriate contact is never okay. There's also a really important role for schools um, to clearly communicate safety policies, to provide resources, um, to support children in accessing counselling services, such as the child helpline that has just been noted, uh, to review or update their child safeguarding policies, uh, to also um, seek digital security mechanisms so that only authorised individuals can access the online uh, learning platforms. 
as has been noted, a really important role for digital technology companies. Um, they can do this in a number of ways, including incorporating safety features into all the devices and education specific platforms. Um, as has been alluded to, particularly um, by Avani Singh, um, ensuring that data collection and other practices are transparent, responsible, and in line with national and international laws and regulations. And then finally, the role of government, who obviously have primary accountability for protection of children's rights. Um, really important to have a comprehensive agenda uh, for strengthening child online protection, which should be embedded uh, within uh, broader strategies for addressing violence against children. Specifically in COVID, there's a need for governments to monitor how containment measures may um, exacerbate different forms of violence, and they should be enforcing existing regulations and strengthening law enforcement to help monitor and respond to risks. Um, I'll just conclude by saying that um, efforts now, so there's a, a raft of efforts, um, but everything that we do now will not only keep children safe during COVID, um, but Importantly, it will also enable communities and countries to emerge from this crisis with stronger systems of protection for children, both offline and online. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, insightful remarks, um, Afros. I am learning as well. Um, and I think from your discussion, I would, the main point that I will take is that there is a difference between uh, risk and, and actual harm. And because I think a lot of people actually uh, confuse uh, the two. Um, so I put Ngatha on the, the spot to just maybe reflect on this discussion. Um, I will give you about uh, seven minutes to do that. And also maybe say a couple of things that the Center for Human Rights is doing in the field of technology and, and human rights. Uh, Gatha, you're with us, right? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, I, I just didn't expect to be put on the spot for seven minutes. I thought it was just a reflection on something very briefly. So I would try not to um, take a lot of time. My reflection is very specific on, I think some of the issues that have already started to come up. Um, would not be new for those of us who have been uh, maybe engaging in the field. And I think it would be fair to say most of the colleagues who are coming from the CSO forum, for instance, that some of these issues have already been raising also in the main session of the committee. So we are glad to take over or to continue that conversation. I see a lot of um, issues of areas of convergence from Please, from the presentations that we've had in the panel today, from uh, uh, Professor Sloth Nelson, um, with, with the specific issues, particularly from a legal point of view, I think those are very interesting and we'll be interested to pick them up. I hear a lot of conversations arising in terms of uh, online content management. We, we've been already engaging on that a little bit, not too much. Uh, issues to do with equality of access and inclusiveness of the digital space, um, considering that uh, the digital space or the digital sphere is here with us to stay. And so either way, we have to find a way of uh, making sure that children's rights are not undermined uh, going forward. Uh, my main concern or the issue that I hear over and over again is the unpreparedness of our legal framework as a, as a region as an African region and, and the harmonization of standards across state to state. I don't think we've, we have probably thought very well um, as, as a collective on how to address the issue of children and access to, or rather children's rights in the context of uh, digital space. And so that would be interesting because I would want to link it up to what we as a center are doing or what we are hoping to get out of this conversation. And then I will open it up for others to come back on it. So um, this webinar is not, is not uh, uh, just something that, uh, that we are doing as a once-off. It's part of a broader program on children's rights in, digital, in the digital sphere. It also has to do with a broader campaign that we run as a center. Um, every year, the center runs a campaign on one particular issue. Last year, it was on migrants. 
This year we are doing it on, on uh, technology and human rights. And so children are as part of that collective, are also part of um, the group that we are looking at their interests. So this falls within um, the center's annual campaign of 2020, which you can find online, you can follow us. The uh, hashtag for that is tech for rights where four is, is a numeral, uh, tech for rights. Please, uh, I see it has been posted on the, on the chat. You can follow it up, uh, publicize the campaign, engage more on the conversation on that. Secondly, um, within the children's rights unit specifically, the focus is on um, children's rights and children's rights to privacy, but within a digital sphere. And in that regard, we are commissioning or we've started out a regional report. As you may have heard from the speakers, there's a lot, there's a bit of a, a dearth of research on exactly what is happening, what is out there in relation to regulation of digital space in as far as children are concerned. So the center has instituted a study in that regard and we are, still, we are in the process of working on it. Our expectation is that we will be able to engage with most of you at some point to get information, to share information, and also to validate the, the, the findings that we will have. But ultimately, we are hoping that we can inform a regional standard. So the general comment that was proposed in the discussions earlier from, uh, from the panelists as or some kind of guidelines. So we'll be looking forward to having the opportunity to engage with you and to engage also with the committee towards the development of that standard. So that really tells you that we are not, this is not a once-off. This is not the last time you hear from us regarding children's rights and digital, uh, in the digital sphere. And we'll be hoping that we can partner with all of you and you can reach out to us if you need to uh, have a discussion on this further. So yeah, Admark, I think I, do, I would rather leave it to participants to engage on the substantive issues, but thank you very much. Uh, th thank you so much, Ngatha, for those uh, remarks. So from the questions, I think uh, the questions that I have in the chat room, one of the issues was how do you balance um, a parental responsibility, particularly the duty to guide the child and direct the child as they grow up, and the issues to do with uh, the right to, to privacy. So it's, it's one of those uh, pressing, pressing issues. Then the other question that arose, which I saw related to internet gov governance and how this perhaps could advance the protection of children's rights, while at the same time promoting the realization of a competitive Africa as, as reflected in Agenda uh, 2063. The other one says, how do you balance the right to privacy for children and the right to care for children, including protecting them from accessing harmful, harmful materials? Um, so for now, I think um, we can, the, our speakers can, can address those issues. If you have any question, you can uh, post the questions now as I give the, the speakers a um, around to address some of these issues. So I think I will start with um, um, Avani, because the, the question really relates to your presentation, the first question. Thanks, Edmark. And I think, you know, just to say that there's no golden rule when you're dealing with how to balance the parental responsibilities with um, the children's rights to privacy. And I, I fully appreciate the tensions that arise in this regard, but a couple of ways in which this, this can be done. Um, the first is, I think, as, as we've discussed already, is the ability to ensure that children are able to make it. So making sure that children are aware of the risks, the harms, the protections available to them. Um, and this requires a really frank and open discussion between educators, between parents and their children as well. Um, and this comes in a number of different ways. So digital literacy is something that I think cannot be gainsaid. Um, the importance of that is just phenomenal. And it's something that I think not only comes um, in the home, but also um, should be embedded early on in the school curriculum. Um, and this also requires parents and educators to be aware of, of both the risks and the opportunities. Um, and so that when we talk about digital literacy, it's not just for children, but for parents and educators as well. 
The second, I think, is around the age of consent, which we started, which I start touching on during my presentation. Um, and here, I think there are different, you know, instead of treating a child as just somebody under the age of 18, looking at the evolving capacities and maturities of children at different phases of their developmental childhood. So below the age of 13, between the ages of 13 and 15, for example, and then above the age of 16, um, there may be different approaches that parents take. Um, and this is something that can be guided by policy, by law, um, and certainly the social media platforms, for example, have started um, attenuating the age of consent. The third, I think, which is really important, is around building in privacy protections and protocols by default into the technologies so that we foster a culture of trust in the technologies that we're using. Um, you know, the, the current situation is that we fundamentally mistrust a lot of the technology because we know that our data is being exploited and we know the risks that arise for children. Um, and this is really twofold. One is to build this in by default. Um, and then the second is around making sure that there are effective remedies available if privacy violations occur. And then the fourth and the last point that I want to make is drawing again from the UK's Information Commissioner's Code of, on Children, which is around parental controls. So, for example, a lot of technologies build in parental controls into their, into their services. But this, I think, needs to be done with a measure of transparency as well. So, for example, if you provide parental controls, you need to give age-appropriate information about these controls. Um, you need to make sure that the online services allow parents to monitor their child's online activities or track their locations, for example, but in a way that the child is aware that this is being done, um, so that this is not just done under a culture or a veil of secrecy, but so that children can also assist in making informed decisions about them, themselves and their, their activities. So those are just a couple of my thoughts on this question. Um, th thank you for that, Evan. I, I want to go back to Prof. Uh, Sloth Nielsen. There is something that keeps on popping up, which is that the, what is the role of technology companies and the internet service providers um, in ensuring that children are actually protected uh, online. I think you touched on some of these issues, but it keeps on um, coming up. The, the role of private ac actors in ensuring that our children are protected online. Prof thank, you for, thank you for that, Dr. Moyer. And I'm glad that you raised that because I would have wanted to address the point that you made about uh, questions popping up about internet governance. Um, I remember from the work that I did in 2016 for the Association for Progressive Communications that one has to look, first of all, at other networks and institutions, organizations to engage with. And I was thinking particularly here of the International Communications Union, which also has, a, as far as I recall, an Africa branch, um, as far as I recall, again, located in Nairobi. And this would be an umbrella organization where we, I think many of us are lawyers like myself, can actually engage more narrowly with the technological issues. And I, I'm interested that you mentioned, um, or did Casa mentioned 2063. We, we don't know what service provision is going to be looking like in even 2040, let alone 2063 as we have seen what has occurred in even the last 10 years to um, the digital environment and streaming and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's an area where one has to be constantly in engagement with new technology. One has to have the requisite legal skills to be able to draft the necessary protocols, guidelines, legislation, that can deal with new forms of technology in the communication sphere, which I have to think is extremely specialized. And this is where I come to the point I made in my presentation about the need for country to country sharing, the need for um, technological uh, or technical skills to be broadened. One cannot expect small countries with a limited number of lawyers who are trying to focus on a criminal practice to have the necessary skills um, at hand working for government or alongside government to assist them in this endeavor. So one needs to look at good practice, one needs to draw on 
other countries where one can find good examples. One needs to possibly consider even regional initiatives such as an SADC model law um, in order to further the uh, interaction between the technical drafters and the communications industry and the challenges of rapidly evolving technology. Without them, we can't go very far. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those remarks, uh, Prof. Um, I also want to inquire from, uh, from Afros what she thinks about these issues. And just maybe add a footnote there, which other speakers may want to come back to. And this is coming from the chat uh, box. The question is, how can an online service provider um, decide whether or not their services uh, you know, will be accessed by, by children? And then I guess it has issues to do with, um, if you are designing your content, how do you decide that this is going to be available to children, this shouldn't be available to children? And I guess it raises, um, I mean, points to do with regulation and the difficulties involved. Uh, because the, the internet is, is a public platform and, and everyone essentially has, has access to it. Um, Afros? Thank you, uh, Dr. Moyo. I think, um, it's a great question, um, and I think it really it it, it uh, brings to the forefront this issue of why, and I think it also came up in in the chat, why we have to engage with perhaps non traditional um, partners in this work because a lot of the people um, it appears from from the chat you know they're people from child rights from child protection uh, backgrounds and the like and not necessarily um, having uh, substantive or traditional um, engagement with with business um, or with um, tech companies um, so I just would, would take the opportunity to, to draw attention of participants in case you're not aware um, of the We Protect Global Alliance. Um, so this is a multi-stakeholder movement to protect children, specifically looking at online um, sexual exploitation, but bringing other issues with respect to data privacy and data protection um, into the fore. Um, the Alliance is endorsed by 97 uh, member states, and there's at least um, 18 um, countries from Africa, um, members of this alliance, and more than 39 civil society and international organizations, and 39 tech companies. So this is really one of the platforms. I think uh, Professor Sloth Nielsen referred to the um, International Telecommunications Union, but the We Protect um, Alliance is another platform that we can really engage with um, and look at how to have these conversations and have these discussions in a way that um, digital technology companies can also understand their responsibility to respect um, and support uh, children's rights through their products and services. So there are a number of ways in which they can do it, which I think we've spoken to um, around incorporating safety features into their devices, um, around ensuring uh, that parents and caregivers also know how to um, uh, use these um, features. Um, there's also a role that they can do with respect to messaging on safe and responsible behavior online, uh, supporting children develop these digital resilient skills. So I think there's good practices um, across the region and it's another, another space where, where I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, sharing the good practices and, and keeping that engagement so that we can find um, solutions that are in the best interests of children. Thank you. Uh, Brother Maxim, can you reflect on any of these issues? Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Okay. Yes, I saw there was a question to say, how do we balance the issue of confidentiality versus online counseling? Uh, I think as child airplanes, we are receiving support from UNICEF, especially the UNICEF Eastern and Southern Africa Regional Office, where we are upgrading the software that the most child airplanes are using. 
so that it is able to incorporate all the social media aspects, all the digital platforms, and also ensure that the issue of privacy is also maintained. So I think uh, the issue of upgrading of software that is being used in the call center uh, through the support of, from UNICEF, SRO, and other partners, I think it's one of ways of trying to ensure that the issue of confidentiality when you're doing online counseling is maintained. And then secondly, the, the, uh, the most chapter plans are conducting training for counselors who are specific, particularly conducting online counseling to say within your pool of counselors, you then select a few who would specialize on conducting online uh, counseling or using Facebook or WhatsApp so that the info, they are the ones who have access to the database, they have access to the software, they get the ones who can be able to log in. So also within those uh, specific pool of counselors, there are those who are specifically trained to do online counseling. It's all to try and maintain the issue of confidentiality. I think there are is also issues of policing, developing how then the guidelines, manuals on doing counseling online. I know Zambia is one, Life Lunch of Zambia is in the process of developing a guideline on how their counselors, how the online counseling is done using Facebook and WhatsApp and many other uh, uh, child helplines are also on the process. But I think like the, uh, what, uh, what other speakers I like to say in terms of policy at national level should then be able to influence also how these policies that are being used by child helplines also should also feed into the national level policies. So that's how the, we are, the child helplines are trying to balance the issue of confidentiality versus online counseling. But it's quite like we said, because of the demand due to COVID restrictions, we have no choice but to also enhance this online counseling, I was at the same time trying to make sure that we still maintain the issue of confidentiality. And from observation, we've seen that children really want to use uh, WhatsApp and social media because we have cases where the counselors, when they receive this, they will ask, are you able to call on the toll free line? They say, no, me, I prefer to chat uh, with you on WhatsApp or on Facebook. So those are some of the, I think the preference that the children are saying they want they also want to prefer to use WhatsApp and Facebook because I think there's that connectivity when they are chatting in terms of they like to be always online attention, getting attention from, from the counselor. So it's one of the methods that we're trying. So those are some of the things that the child plans are trying to put in place to make sure that we balance the issue of confidentiality whilst providing online counseling. Um, th thank you. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, Gatha, can you reflect a bit on the challenges associated with uh, uh, social media companies and, and how this, this affects children? Okay, um, let me, I'm trying to get my camera back on. <laughs> okay, um, just uh, on top of my head, I think one of the reflections or one of the issues that has come up over and over again is um, is the issue of you know um, relationship between children and social media companies, which the social media companies are obviously you know huge giants, and most of the cases children don't really have leverage uh, on dealing with the companies if anything should go wrong. And I think one of the conversations that that we are not really you know we're not bridging a lot is the legal sector or people who are you know specialized in enforcing law vis-a-vis -vis child welfare protection uh, people who work on a day-to-day -day basis so advocating for the same things but speaking different languages and so because of that you find that within the child rights sector there is a lot of emphasis on the negative effects of access to digital technology for children and the risks the heightened risks of children's engagement with the media but we are not really um, getting or we are not, that conversation is not evolving far enough to start talking about accountability measures when children are violated. So for instance, we can't talk about just about the risk uh, without talking about how do we hold um, major, you know, social media and other internet companies um, liable if something goes wrong for children. How, and, and one of those issues is in terms of not having a regional uh, framework through which we can enforce accountability. 
So, for instance, you find that most of the of the um, of these companies have a very strong legal basis for the work that they do. Most children just sign uh, consents. We don't really even review what goes into those consents. So the companies are by definition protected because children supposedly give consent or parents give consent on their behalf. And so the, there isn't an opportunity to actually enforce accountability if something should go wrong or if uh, uh, privacy is, is uh, violated. That's one. Secondly, we are having a sort of disjointed conversations, uh, disjointed to the extent that we are talking about child protection on the one, one hand, maybe, you know, legal enforcement of the standards on another hand, but we, are, we, we don't really talk much about redress. Um, and if, you know, like, you know, if, even if you enforce, but the, the full extent of redress, so does it look in a digital sphere? But in addition to that, if you think about it is, the exploitative element and the marketing element. There is, there is a lot of um, invasive and I would say not exploitative, but predatory marketing that is happening to children online. That is also not something that we, we think about because most of the time we are thinking about the things that children themselves choose to consume. But what about the things that are targeted at children actually deliberately? I don't think that we are having a lot of, you know, that I've heard a lot of people talking about the predatory um, targeting of children online for marketing purposes. I think that's another thing to, to consider. But I think one of the final things that I have to think about is, yes, there is a conversation happening within media, not media, but within the social media companies uh, uh, to think about their own role in design that is uh, child-friendly. And But I think as an African region, there is need for us to really specifically and collectively advocate for representation so that these social media platforms also represent an African context. The things that, that determine whether a child is of age within an African context might be very different in, a diff, in another area where children here don't have um, birth certificates, for instance, or references that, that, you know, the usual things that we can ask for, for a child to prove that they are of age. Some of those assumptions can be made from a very Western perspective, but we do need to have a region a regional and contextualized way of knowing that our children are, are accessing appropriate media. So those are some of the things. The issue on top of my head, I would think one, uh, we need a framework for accountability for huge or for internet companies and uh, social provide, I mean, service providers. I think two, we need a design consciousness that we can, we can uh, work with various companies that are that are providing services or internet services for, for children. And thirdly, I think we need inclusion. We need really contextualizing and inclusive design and content that reflects the children of Africa, the needs of, of children in Africa. Well, children are on the, on the internet, but on the African continent, the motivations for why children go online might be very different for why children go online in Europe or the US. So obviously we need to have a different and contextualized approach. So yeah, I think if we can reflect on that, we can start to see the ways in which we can get technology companies to start respecting the perspectives of African children. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I will just abuse my um, chairpersonship um, and ask a, uh, a couple of questions. And after this round, we should be now uh, closing. So, one of the issues that has emerged in this discussion is the need for a multi-sectoral response. And um, Afros did refer us to the We Protect Global Alliance. My question is, how does this sort of multi-sectoral response look like at the domestic level? Because I think that's where violations of rights actually taking place, like in different countries. Um, how, how can we have this sort of partnership to ensure that these key issues that are emerging from children's rights in the digital era are actually addressed. Then uh, the other issue that I, I think I have is that, uh, and, and Avani touched on that, Prof touched on that as well, and, and even Afros, this idea of the evolving capacities. Because I think if the evolving capacities of the child are used or applied to to try and address the inconsistencies between the rights of children 
to actually explore the internet and find relevant content and also make friends and have social intellectual development online. Um, how do you then uh, balance that in, in, in real practice? Because I think one of the, the main challenges in this is that while of course the children's capacities are, are evolving in this context, you have in many contexts, children were actually doing self-parenting online. Either because the parent doesn't know how to operate the smartphone, um, or is less digitally literate than the child who should actually be guided. So in those instances, how do you then uh, say, for example, that the parent or the teacher, whoever they are, um, should actually be able to, to address this, this concern? And I raise this because of the now known talk about the digital divide. Uh, we all know that in, in low resource contexts, uh, parents really got to have access to ICTs late uh, in life. And they suffer from what has been called the, the cohort effect, that their development in terms of managing to actually explore the internet and have those safeguards to ensure that children are safe online, that ability is limited because of this, this cohort uh, effect. The, other issue that I wanted you to address relates to this issue of access to education and, and the fact that we have, as Prof said, I think she said 297 million uh, kids um, out of school. I would say that that is an um, intellectual genocide that is taking place, particularly against um, you know, African uh, children and uh, children from other uh, developing, developing countries, particularly in the global uh, south. So my question is, how do you sort of um, expand perhaps the interpretation of international instruments and domestic human rights instruments to actually ensure that governments are bound, and they are aware of this, they are bound to establish the necessary infrastructure to ensure that children in the future, should we face a pandemic of this magnitude, um, that right to, to, to education is, is, is observed. So um, after you, you address these this this questions, I think uh, we will then close the, the session. I'll start with Prof and we go through the line uh, to the end. Thank you, Dr. Moyo. I'm, I'm only going to pick up on one or two points so that I can leave scope for other uh, panelists to, to contribute. Um, firstly, I'd like to talk about the issue that um, Dr. Murungi raised about redress. And I, I don't know whether there's anybody participating today that is from a national human rights institution or the growing, small, still but growing cohort of ombuds for children but clearly the point of individual children being unable to secure uh, remedies and redress is a, is a very real one and it, that operates in all social and economic contexts. So we have to harness the forces that we can. And I, I do believe that we need to think about specialized training for the children's desks at national human rights institutions to alert them to the dangers that they might come into contact with it through complaints mechanisms and we can try at least and secure um, some avenues for complaints through existing mechanisms. Second, when we talk about governance and accountability, we need to establish clearly in respect of, of individual member states which government department we're looking at. Traditionally, those of us in the justice sector, in the child protection sector, deal with the we, Department of Justice. We can't hear you, Prof. Um, Sorry. <coughs> Traditionally, yeah. those of us in the um, child protection space deal and child rights space deal with the Department of Justice or a Department of Social Welfare um, or an allied department. But I think we have to look at where the locus of responsibility lies in the communication space, which might be somewhere entirely different with the Ministry of the Interior, where there is no sensitization to uh, children's rights or Ministry of Communications. So we need to get our, um, our targets lined up 
so that we can intervene more effectively and support government initiatives. I, I will stop there, but thank you very much for the opportunity to participate and I have enjoyed this interaction also with the chat room very, very much. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Prof. Um, have any, any closing remarks? Yes, I just want to touch quickly on this idea of multi-stakeholderism. I think that the example of internet governance forums have been really useful, where they, where we have domestic governance IGFs, sub-regional IGFs that feed into a regional IGF and then a global one. And I think that's where we, where we're dealing with power imbalances um, against um, those of us based in Africa versus technology companies that are, have their jurisdiction outside of Africa. I think those kinds of strategies are really useful. Um, again, we need appropriate capacity building. Um, and then the last thing I just want to point out is that I think we really need to shift our narrative around the importance of the right to privacy. And I think more and more it needs to become a question of privacy by default, um, where this is built in from the start to the technologies that we use um, for children, for adults, um, and, and really start demanding agency over our personal information both for ourselves, for, for the children that we, we look after, um, and, and for our society as a whole. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Edmar. Thank you, Fanny. Um, any closing remarks, Brother Maxim? Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think just to add on the issue of multi-sectoral, uh, as child airplanes, we really work with the private uh, technology companies because they're the ones that are providing services, the toll frees, and the relevant government information ministries and etc. So there's been that push to make sure that we really engage the private sector companies that provide the services to the child airplanes to make sure that the issue of address the issue of confidentiality, the issue of upgrading the systems that is being supported by UNICEF and other companies. So we really need to continue engaging the private sector, especially the technology providing companies and say, making sure that the internet is safe for children. So I think we really need to continue because we can't run away from it. The use of digital platforms, especially providing services is on the increase. So we really need to make sure that the children are safe as we engage these private uh, telecoms companies and the other in service provid providers. Yeah, th thank you for that. And I'm happy most constitutions now bind uh, private persons horizontally. Um, can I request um, um, Afros to uh, give final remarks before we close this session? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Moyo. The questions you posed were um, very insightful and I think uh, there's no easy answers, uh, obviously, and they're issues that um, we need to continue to grapple with at national, regional, and, and indeed at a global um, level. But the, the points I will just grab to, to conclude on, um, not to overlap on things my fellow panelists have mentioned, is the issue you talked about parents and, um, and the digital divide, um, particularly in the African context. So I think um, that is indeed a real challenge and parenting in the digital age um, is, is a whole new ball game. Um, I think I just wanted to emphasize a point that um, what the literature is showing that obviously parents who are able to encourage, guide and share in their children's experience in the digital sphere, um, enable their children to get better digital skills and wider opportunities. And this is much more in contrast to, to parents who take a more restrictive approach where they try and limit, ban or police. So that's, that's one point I just wanted to mention. But in a context where um, digital literacy is, is low, um, I think there's also a really important role for policymakers and for, for advocacy, uh, for policymakers to support teachers, to support administrators, to support school boards, um, to support um, the building of uh, children's digital resilience uh, where, where, where there are those um, enormous gaps. So um, those are the couple of points I'll, I'll conclude on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Afros. We have reached the end of this discussion, but perhaps before we formally close, let me just to thank the speakers for making time to ensure that they, they are part of this uh, panel. 
um, they are busy people and, and it's really a sacrifice for you to be with us. I also want to thank our interpreters um, who have uh, worked really hard for us to be able to reach out to uh, Francophone countries, Arabic countries, and Lusophone um, countries. Um, then I want to share, thank um, Jennifer, uh, Felistas, and the team uh, at the CSO Forum for a wonderful job, and I can uh, confess you are able to really work under pressure. Then my colleagues at the Children's Rights uh, Institute and the Center for Human Rights, um, my superior, Ankatha, the Assistant Director of the Center for Human Rights, uh, my friend, Claire Ngiwe, um, Alina, um, Yolanda, um, Truna, and the entire technical team. Uh, so thank you so much for making this event a success. Lastly, I want to thank our participants uh, for joining us. I think uh, we enjoyed your presence and we enjoyed the, the questions that you were posing on, in the chat room. A lot of insightful remarks. I, if I left anything that you think we should have uh, raised, I want to, to apologize. We are now pressed for time. So thank you everyone from me at the heart of Pretoria. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.